Peace be unto you all. Thank you for being here this afternoon for this wonderful panel. My name is Rhonda Britton. I am the senior pastor of Koala Street Baptist Church around the corner from this place. And we look forward today to a lively discussion with you as we explore various aspects of the life and philosophy of Malcolm X. So first I want to introduce to you our distinguished panel. We have with us today uh, L. Jones, who's Halifax's Poet Laureate, prison rights activist, and a PhD candidate at Dow University. Dr. Isaac Zaney, who is the Transition Year Program Director for Dalhousie University and Adjunct Professor of History at St. Mary's University. <laughs> Dr. Afua Cooper, who is really our host today, she is the James Robinson Johnston Chair of Black Canadian Studies at Dalhousie University. And the JRJ Chair joined together with the uh, library to sponsor and the uh, Transition Year Program to sponsor this for us today. And I see also the No Harbor for War Editorial Committee is listed as a sponsor. And then we have Dr. John Monroe, Assistant Professor of History at St. Mary's University. So we have some wonderful minds around the table, I think, um, and the topics that they're each going to address um, will fascinate you and, of course, help us to engage in quite a lively discussion. This year, we know 2015, and actually today, February 21st, marks the 50th anniversary of the death of Malcolm X. He was assassinated by Thomas Hagen on this day in 1965 while giving a speech to the Organization of Afro-American Unity in Manhattan's Audubon Ballroom in New York. This is the group, the uh, OAAU is the group that X started after breaking with Elijah Muhammad and the Nation of Islam. And although he was only 39 years old when he was killed, his name remains in history as one of the most influential and outspoken activist of the 20th century. So today we're going to talk about why that is. Our panelists will each share some prepared remarks. They each have 10 to 12 minutes to do that. And I want to encourage the other panelists and the audience to jot down any questions that you may have that come to your mind as the presenters are making their uh, presentations to you. And then we will, after we hear each panelist, I will open the floor for discussion between the panelists and the audience. And so we're going to start with Dr. Afua Cooper, who's gonna come and talk to us about the religious life of Malcolm X. Thank you everyone for coming out uh, on this anniversary of Malcolm X's assassination. Assalamu alaikum and Bismillah rahman rahim which means in the name of God, most gracious, most merciful. <clears throat> so I've prepared some notes on the religious life of Malcolm X and I thought I'd speak to that because Oftentimes, when we um, talk about Malcolm X, is usually, um, from my perspective, a kind of one-dimensional figure, uh, image of Malcolm X. Um, it's almost as if um, we we want to forget that he himself was was deeply religious, uh, was a Muslim, and. Um, was grounded and centered by his 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 life as as a Muslim. What do we know of Malcolm X's religious life? We know that his father, Earl Little, was probably a Baptist minister, as he appeared numerous times on Baptist podiums preaching 
um, the UNIA message. I said probably a Baptist minister, could we get conflicting reports? Um, we, we heard he was, but then one of his children, Malcolm X's brother, Phil Bird, said, my dad wasn't really a minister. He would, uh, because he was a UNIA worker, he would often travel to different towns, <coughs> and the Black Baptist, the church, the minister would give him the opportunity to address the congregation, to speak about UN, UNIA message and Marcus Garvey's message. Um, the UNIA means Universal Negro Improvement Association. And it was an organization founded by Marcus Garvey um, after the First World War to, to, you know, as part of the Black Liberation Strategy. And Earl Little, Malcolm X's father, was a ardent, ardent Garveyite. And he was eventually murdered and uh, assassinated and you know the house of, of the, the little the little family was, was destroyed by white supremacists. So we know there was that influence in um, in Garvey's life. We also know that his mother, <coughs> Louise Langdon Norton, was a, a kind of heterodox Christian. What do I mean by that? She she wasn't she didn't belong to any one particular denomination, if she belonged to any at all. She took the children to, to various denominations and uh, finally when she was um, seized by the state because after her husband, her little was murdered, she had a nervous breakdown and, and was um, taken into a mental institution. But the last memory of her children um, with her as, you know, being involved in any kind of religious religiosity was the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And she chose to go to the Seventh-day Adventist Church because um, their dietary principles adhere with her, her own diet. She had become a, a practicing vegan. And she felt that the Seventh-day, they, they weren't into pork. In fact, they weren't into eating meat at all. They didn't even use sugar. They had a strict kind of vegan diet that she wanted the children to adhere to. Um, so, in fact, when um, children's services started seizing the children and putting them in foster homes and so on, uh, she would say to them one of her last words of advice was, don't eat any pork, don't eat any pork or any pork products. So from the very start, she instilled in the children a no pork philosophy. And then we know the trajectory of, um, of Malcolm's life from prison in the Nation of Islam, they call that the grave, when you're sort of in the world, in Islamic vocabulary, that would mean be the dunya. His, his trajectory from being in prison, um, leaving prison, or in fact embracing the Nation of Islam while being in prison, coming out of prison, being a, a kind of star minister, becoming assistant minister of the Nation of Islam Temple in Detroit, and then um, from towards the end of the 50s, being sent to New York, where he was full minister at um, Temple, Temple Number no. 7 in Harlem. Um, <clears throat> so that's the kind of trajectory we have. And then after that, after his break with the nation, in towards the end of 1963, Malcolm sort of quote unquote, embracing Orthodox Islam, made a pilgrimage to Mecca, and so on. That's the trajectory. We, we kind of know that. But I'm going to um, say some more things to make the story bigger. As I said, that's a picture we, we traditionally see of Malcolm. Malcolm holding a gun, a kind of, you know, the militant Malcolm. Um, in fact, it's almost like from St. Paul's, the Apostle, where I think in I don't remember which book, he said something, I'm all things to everyone so I may gain some. That's how I think the uh, black community in North America have sort of taken Malcolm. He's everything to everyone except, except a Muslim. But <clears throat> Malcolm's religiosity is much more complex. In fact, we're still calling him Malcolm X, when in fact, he started calling himself Malik Shabazz or Malachi Shabazz since 1949 when he was incarcerated. 
And we actually can refuse to call him al Haj Malik Shabazz to this day for reasons I don't know. In the, the black nationalist and Afrocentric circles, as I've said, the previous image is an image that we, is very popular of Malcolm. We tend not to see this image where Malcolm is in a, is in a prayer pose. And I think this picture was taken of Malcolm X when he made the, um, the Hajj to Mecca in 1964, April, May 1964. But while my, Malcolm was in prison, let me just go back, because even, even he, he himself puts forth this, um, this history of himself, when you read his autobiography. He's in prison, he begins to get uh, letters from Elijah Muhammad, they begin to correspond, he becomes a Nation of Islam person while in prison, he leaves prison, and you know, the rest is history. But even before Malcolm X went to prison, he, he and one of his friends, a man by the name of Malcolm Jarvis, Malcolm Shorty Jarvis, they were in the hood doing criminal activities. But at that time, they were being tutored by a, an Ahmadiyya Muslim by the name of Abdul Hamid. This is way before Malcolm X stepped into history, as we know it. So in fact, he already had Islamic influences before he went to prison. When he went to prison, and his, his his sisters, his siblings, it's, in fact, it seems that all of the little siblings converted to Nation of Islam. And they started visiting their bro uh, brother in prison. And they said, there's a way out. You can't get out of prison. You can't change your life. So the whole little family, almost, almost all of them converted to Nation of Islam and, and brought their brother, this Malcolm X, along with them and helped him. In fact, his Prison sentence was 10 years, he served six and a half years. He sort of became a model prisoner, and as a result, he, he got out early. When he got out in um, 1952, went to Detroit, met Elijah Muhammad for the first time, he became his mentor, a father figure, in fact, and became, developed a deep bond with Elijah Muhammad and, um, and the family of Elijah's sister Clara, Elijah's mother Marie, and so on. So, <clears throat> but of course, as we all know, he was a gifted orator, very, very passionate in, in what he believes in, embraced the black struggle um, while in Detroit, continued in New York. He, his rise was so uh, fast because he was so gifted, and Elijah Muhammad saw in him the apostle that he needed to kind of bring people to the fold. In fact, Malcolm X, um, one author credits Malcolm X for a rapid uh, admission of people into the nation of Islam. In fact, when Malcolm went to New York and toured the United States, so many thousands and thousands of people came to the nation of Islam as a result of Malcolm X's um, preaching. He drew thousands of people to, to, the, um, to the cause. Now, one of his very good friends, uh, Benjamin Kareem, he said that Malcolm X often did not, a lot of people didn't know about this side of him. As minister of Temple Number no. 7 in Harlem, every Saturday, he took the kids, the children of the, the members of, of that mosque, they, they went to the museum, they went to the zoo, they went to the planetarium. He had all kinds of enrichment activities for the children. Okay, the lessons Malcolm taught were simple ones, and he lived his life by them, Benjamin Kareem said. Be honest, harm no one. Um, take nothing that is not yours. Treat others as you would want to be treated by them. Practice charity. Exercise self-control. Avoid extremes. Keep on a middle path. Pay your taxes <laughs> and, above, and obey the law. Right? The keep on a middle path is, is interesting, uh, as Benjamin said, because avoid extremes. And you know, in Islamic philosophy, that is the Surat al-Mustaqim, the middle path. Don't go too left or too right. Keep on this middle path, avoid extremism. Malcolm X 
as you know, was very involved too in the civil rights movement, in the Pan-Africanist movement, in the anti-colonial movement. Um, he was very influenced by the Bandung Conference in 1955 in Indonesia. And the Bandung Conference was called by Ahmed Sukarno, the president of Indonesia. And it was really to bring the independent Asian and African countries together in what became known as a non-aligned movement. He was very influenced by that because he saw if the colored peoples of the world unite, then it could uh, defeat that unity, could defeat American and European imperialism. Now, I'm just going to read this. Malcolm X's link with the Muslim world. In 1959, as the Supreme Minister in New York, Elijah Muhammad sent him to, to Egypt. Um, Gamal Abdul Nasser, who was the president of Egypt, invited Elijah Muhammad to Egypt. The United States government refused to give Elijah Muhammad a passport, so he couldn't go. So instead, he sent his number one minister, minister uh, Malik Shabazz, to Egypt. While in Egypt, or uh, he also visited Jerusalem, Damascus, he went to Saudi Arabia, and Jeddah. Um, he did not make it to Mecca uh, due to health problems. In any event, Malcolm returned with a renewed determination to forge stronger bonds with Africa and the Muslim world. According to historian Malcolm Gomez, Malcolm X's strategy was twofold to achieve Islamic orthodoxy and to become a full African person in direct contact with African leaders and involved in their struggles in exchange for which he sought assistance in the fight against racism in the United States. Finally, in 1964, Malcolm um, X began a trip to Africa that included the pilgrimage to Mecca. So he has become this international statesman. And by now, he had the break with the Nation of Islam, which I won't go into because maybe other <coughs> people will. He performed the Hajj at Mecca, where he was a guest of um, the Saudi prince Faisal. He flew to Beirut, Cairo, Lagos. He appeared on TV in Lagos, um, addressed university students. He traveled to Ghana, addressed the Ghanaian parliament as a guest of Nkrumah. And on his birthday, May 19th, we find him in Algiers, in Algeria, then Morocco, and Senegal. So less than two months in July, he was back in Africa and the Middle East on an extended um, uh, trip with African and Muslim leaders. The Hajj was important for Malcolm X. By then, he had make, made the break with Elijah Muhammad. The Hajj is important for any Muslims. It's one of the five pillars of Islam. And it's, if, if it, you have it in your means, you should make the Hajj. That is a pilgrimage to Mecca. In fact, uh, it was his sister, Ella, his oldest sister, who her, she had left the nation too and had embraced Sunni Islam, who paid for his, his Hajj um, to Mecca. It was not enough that Malcolm was an intellectual and a gifted orator. He required spiritual sanction, and the Hajj did that. And I'm going to read what he said, and I'll be finished. After making the Hajj in April, May 19, uh, 1964, he said, these are his direct words, in my 39 years on earth, the holy city of Mecca, stand in the holy city of Mecca, had been the first time I had ever stood before the creator of all and felt like a complete human being. So what I'm saying is that we can't just take Malcolm X one side. We have to take Malcolm X in all of who he, he is. People nowadays are talking, yeah, we can leave it at that. People nowadays are talking about intersectionality. Malcolm X wasn't, you know, a Pan-Africanist this morning and a Muslim this evening. He was everything at the same time. And his religion, his Islam, was extremely, crucially, the center of his identity. And that's what grounded him and gave him the strength and the, the you know, the matin, as we say in Islam, which means the fortitude to continue his work. Thank you very much. Dr. Cooper, and now
now we're going to hear from our poet laureate, who's going to share with us uh, Malcolm X and the prison system. Good afternoon. Peace, everybody. Peace. I'm going to steal some of my time, meaning I'm going over, because I am going to open with a poem that's quite an old poem that I wrote for the youth in particular. I wrote it after I got back from Memphis and I had seen the Civil Rights Museum and there's only one little bit that's Malcolm and everything else of course is Martin and I know we'll be talking about that later. Um, but I also felt this poem came into its own when I did it over the prison phone at Burnside. Burnside doesn't have contact visits if you guys, I don't know if you go there, but um, federal you get you know, contact, but in Burnside it's like that behind glass with the phone. So I had to do the poem on the prison phone and I always felt that that was it was meant for and that's why Malcolm gave me this poem so that years later it could be brought into a jail. So I'm going to open with this poem and then I'm going to talk in particular about what the importance of Malcolm is in the context of this tough on crime legislation in Canada uh, and in particular how the legacy of Malcolm still moves through our prisons and then how we can work to resist uh, some of these, and I'm particularly going to focus, I like that Afua talked about Malcolm's sisters uh, coming to the prison and their role, because I also want to talk about the role of women in prison support. But I'm going to do this poem as well. I know I can get through this life with this spirit inside me when I step to the mic. I feel his voice rise inside me. I keep his book beside me because I know he died for me. The autobiography of Malcolm X. This is his story. You maybe think he's a character invented by Spike Lee, but Malcolm X was the real deal. He didn't have no movie deal. He was revolutionary. He taught black people the solution. He tried to free our minds from the pollution of history. The European has you roped in. He colonized your mind with your Oprah. I mean, Europe. Keep your open eyes because you're up next. You will change your opinion, repeat all their lies, that slavery. The media has you crazy, so you want to copy Jay-Z. These racist record labels want to keep black men as babies, so they give you names like Lil Wayne. It's degrading, but Malcolm Little changed his name. He would never be labeled. He would have been ashamed of these fake thugs. We idolize who tell you how they took nine slugs and survived, but that is a lie. Don't believe the hype. It's makeup. They are selling us drugs because they don't want us to wake up. The images on BET are owned by snakes who hate hate us, but Malcolm wasn't fake. He was always straight up. Malcolm was courageous. He got shot in the chest 16 times and he died. And it wasn't for money or rims on his ride or hose or bling or to get famous. He never got paid. He got shot to save us. And we can't even raise our fists and make them stay up. We complain about how the government let Biggie's killers escape while we let Malcolm's killers get away with it every day because we put money in the pockets of the CIA every time we use Facebook. They got your Facebook, but Malcolm faced them down with one look. He didn't care about the profits. He cared about the profit. Brother Malcolm got it. Malcolm tried to stop it. Malcolm saw how the ghetto keeps you caged. He was sucked into that gangster shit too. When he was your age, he was just like you. He hustled on the streets for change. He went to prison, but he read the Quran and he changed. He hooked up with Elijah and changed his name. He was light skin. He could have passed, but he never changed. And Sister Betty Shabazz and her children carry on his name. We should all be ashamed of how we forget these heroes' names. If Malcolm could see us now, he would be spinning in his grave, but he would have died for us just the same. And I wish he could come back and do it all again because it's 50 years later and we're still mentally in chains because we can't even speak his name at Obama's inauguration. They're trying to erase him. It's crazy how they got us shaken, but Malcolm wasn't afraid. Not even when he was taken from his mama. They locked her away when she had a nervous breakdown because his father was killed by the KKK. They had him run down. They burned his house down. He wanted to be a lawyer, but his teacher told him to dumb down, so he went to New York and pimped after sundown. He was breaking into homes because his luck was down. The police would have had him cut down, so he told them he surrendered and put his gun down. He was sent to the Massachusetts State Prison in Charlestown for a lockdown. He educated himself by reading when they turned the prison lights down. He wouldn't let them keep him down. Let me tell you how the rest of his story goes down. He joined the Elijah Muhammad's group. They thought of themselves as Allah's fruit. They respected themselves. So they dressed in bow ties and suits. He protected the neighborhood from police roots. He taught black people how to break the noose. He stopped conking his hair and loved his nappy roots. He would not march on Washington. 
Washington with MLK because he would not be used. Instead, he met with Castro and reclaimed his African roots when the army drafted for Vietnam. He taught Ali to refuse. He spoke out against oppression and human rights abuse. He went to Mecca and it set his spirit loose. The FBI spied on him because they wanted proof. They say the Nation of Islam killed him, but I think it was spooks. They couldn't silence his message, and so they had to shoot. They try to smear his name because he told the truth. He said Kennedy's assassination was the chickens coming home to roost. He knew you can't dismantle Mass's house by using Mass's tools, and they're still trying to hide his message from the youth. There's no excuse for the way they lie about his views. They teach you Martin, but they leave Malcolm out of schools because he tried to teach black people not to be fooled. So stop being fooled. Don't believe that stuff you hear on the news. It just amuses them. They get together and plot and try to confuse us when they say the system includes us and they screw us and they pip out the black president on CNN and we'll attend because we're still obsessed with being them. But playing that game is not the same as beating them. We die defending them. We're not even human beings to them. We invest in them, get dressed by them, press our hair like them so the press can repress our youth protesting how we're less than them. They arrest us when we start to threaten them. We sell ourselves to them. We all reject our own so we can get with them and we mess with them and they infect us, then we get so stressed, our life is 10 years less than them. That's not disease. We die from being oppressed by them. That is not freedom till we seek freedom, being free from them. Don't ever trust in them because it never ends. We are blessed to have his lessons unsuppressed by them. And his spirit will not rest until we forget that mess and focus on the message sent by Brother Malcolm X until we free our minds from them. We'll never love ourselves. And until then, I will progress with his mission inside me. When I step off the mic, I feel his spirit drive me. I keep his book beside me because I know he died for me. The autobiography of Malcolm X. This is your history. That was my So I had a sort of typical, maybe intense day yesterday, but I want to speak about, um, first of all, some of the voices of the people that can't be in this room because they are incarcerated. Uh, my day started with a call from a young man, Aiden, who's been in prison for murder. And I actually thought of Malcolm as I was talking to him because he was telling me that he came out with a, I pray to Allah sometimes. And he said, when I pray to Allah, my prayers are answered because I prayed to not be transported to the max this week and I wasn't transported, so Allah is answering my prayers. And it was sad because he doesn't want to go up and he got maxed, right? Because if you're under Harper, if you're convicted of murder, second degree, first degree, you have to do time in a maximum institution, no matter how young you are, no matter what your circumstances are. Um, so it was a sad thing to say, but then it was also a beautiful thing that he had found, like Malcolm in prison, that Allah has spoken to him there. Uh, we went to a bail hearing for another young man who did not get his bail. Um, because he has an extensive criminal record uh, due to circumstances in his life. But he called me afterwards, and he was quite down about it. Um, but he was saying that he never had support in his life, you know, so that people coming to court for him and speaking for him made this intense difference to him. And then he said, you know, I would be embarrassed to get in trouble now uh, if I got out, because I know that people are relying on me. And I was thinking, I wish the judge could have heard that, because the judge was saying, essentially, you know, I, I don't think he has a conscience. I don't think he can be bound by surety, I don't think this is going to matter to him because I'm looking at this record. Um, and I think of what we have on the table there, you know, the image of Malcolm. People change, don't give up on our youth. Right? Malcolm, who has said, you know, nobody was down in the mud more than I was. You know, nobody could, yes, this is the, oh, shoot. Uh, so if you see the picture, and the quote from Malcolm underneath it is, I believe that it would be almost impossible to find anywhere in America a black man who has lived further down in the mud of human society than I have or a black man who's been any more ignorant than I have, or a black man who has suffered more anguish during his life than I have. But it's only after the deepest darkness that the greatest joy can come. It is only after slavery and prison that the sweetest appreciation of freedom can come. Um, for me, that is the enduring legacy of Malcolm, beyond Malcolm's philosophy, beyond the life lessons, beyond his radical philosophy. What I think is so profound for me and for so many of our young people right now is this trajectory of Malcolm. Uh, that Malcolm recognized how freedom existed in his mind. He talks about reading in prison. He says, you know, I had never been more free. And for months at a time, I forgot that I was even in prison. This would not, of course, be possible in our prisons right now. 
Um, if you're in Burnside, you actually don't have a library. Um, Burnside, because one of the inmates was having an affair with the guard, is how they put it. I would put it being sexually assaulted by a person in a position of authority over an inmate. Mm -hmm. But um, because that was happening in the library, they blocked all access to the library in Burnside. Um, cells, when they uh, flip the cells, cells are rated for too many books. So they're allowed to have one book at a time or two books at a time. They're not allowed more than that. And the books they have in Burnside are Harlequin romances and Black Scarface. Uh, so everyone reads Black Scarface, that travels around the, the jail, everybody reads that, which is a tale of a drug lord, which is okay to read. Um, I was sending in, I sent in uh, Our Prison's Obsolete by Angela Davis, and I got that in, and then they cracked down, so they wouldn't let me send the history of the Black Panther Party, or the FBI's secret war on the Panthers, uh, those both got rejected. Um, one of them for violent gang imagery, because it had Huey with a gun on the cover. So, um, one of the points is that Malcolm was, that the things that were available to Malcolm, he was transferred to a progressive prison in Norfolk, and what was available to him was an extensive prison library. He read works of philosophy, Du Bois, Socrates, um, you know, all over Western philosophy, all kinds, he, his, his reading list was extensive. He said that, you know, you know university student would be given the kind of reading list that I have. In Canada, that would not be available, the lack of prison libraries right now. Um, there is sometimes funny, they try to get dedicated prison librarians, um, but within our programming, that's one of the things that is being cut. In the States, which is also coming in Canada, if you are caught with black radical literature, it counts automatically as being a gang um, possession, and they can put you into solitary with no evidence. So you could have a copy of the autobiography, that could be found in your cell. You wouldn't even know that they were saying that this was a radical gang affiliation, and you could end up in solitary. You have no chance to appeal your movement to solitary. Um, this also, not to the same extent in Canada, but because of your parole records. Um, for example, Aiden, who writes Black Radical Poetry, his parole record says, exhibits nonconformist social attitudes. Um, so nonconformist to who? So if you want to get out of prison, you have to demonstrate that you no longer hold, quote, nonconformist uh, social attitudes. So whose norms? But these are the things that prevent people from getting parole. I've been advised by many people that black guys don't get parole. In the East, you will have to go into the West. So in Nova Scotia, you will not get parole. Um, so Malcolm got out, as uh, we were saying, six and a half years into ten. Um, that is not a reality for our young black men in this province and in the prisons in Atlantic Canada. Theoretically, you serve two-thirds unless you're on a life sentence. In practice, um, the parole for black people, as we know, has been done in multiple studies. You receive much less access to parole. Um, I was actually talking to a parole officer. We have black inmate gatherings in Truro, and they bring all the inmates. And I was actually talking to them about going back to school. And I mentioned a young man that I had taught at NSCC. And the parole officer literally argued with me, there is no way he is the valedictorian. And I was like, he was the valedictorian in our class. That's not possible. He refused to believe me. His behavior, no, there's no way. You couldn't be. It's not the same person. I'm saying, yes, he was a leader in our class. He got the award for the best person. They, he did, this officer did not believe that this young man could change. He did not believe he had the capacity to go to school. And this is somebody that is now doing business that is extremely successful in the community. So um, these are the attitudes that you confront when you try to get out of prison. Um, I could talk to you about you know, the phone systems, the canteen systems, uh, the fact that many of our people are transported into Ontario. So um, one young man has just been transported away from his family. He doesn't want to go, but they feel that he's at risk in our prisons because he has gang affiliations, AKA if you're from the Square or North Preston, they like to move you out into Ontario. Um, no access to your family and then you don't get visits, what are you supposed to do? And then they turn around and say you don't have family support, you didn't have visits, so therefore you're not a stable element in the community. Um, I could talk about these things forever, so what I want to say is that when we look at Malcolm's legacy in prison as well, we need to recognize in our prison system in Canada right now, the resources that Malcolm had, minimal as they were in prison, are being stripped away. There's no non-Christian chaplains. Uh, that's something that Harper put in. So only Christian chaplains exist in our prisons full time. And that's not for other religions, it's specifically to prevent the spread of Islam <coughs> within our prisons. Um, because that's where the black guys are gathering. There's still an active uh, Muslim brotherhood within the prisons. Um, Ada, for example, mentioned something about Muslims and got a kite. <laughs> a, a note from another guy in a cell, are you interested in Islam? I will send you material. Um, so there's always been a ministry uh, within our prisons, particularly that black guys are drawn to. So as a result, the prisons have actively worked to remove that. Um, so the kind of material, the, the mail material that Malcolm was sending back and forth would likely be monitored in this day and age under terrorism laws. Um, so a letter a day to Elijah Muhammad, that would not happen. 
Uh, the prison certainly has no obligation to allow you to receive or send radical mail. So um, we can guess, especially under the new terrorism laws of the past, that that would be something monitored by the prison staff. So we need to recognize within our own country um, that at the same time as the spirit of Malcolm flows through our prisons, and you see it every day in the kind of resistance that our brothers and sisters show, and of course black women are the fastest growing rate of incarcerated people as well, so it's not just our brothers. But um, we see it every day in what they do, in that they continue to write, they continue to support each other. The Black Brotherhood, for example, which is active in Renews, and they continue to, to gather together to offer support. But at the same time, we need to recognize that our prison system is you know, increasingly tough on crime, meaning cutting down on the rights and supports. Then my second part is what can we do? And I mentioned that Afua uh, spoke about Malcolm's sisters in coming to prison. I, that element is so important. We often tend to think of Malcolm in this very male environment. You know, we soon think of the man who educated himself and he did this. And of course, there were women present. And there are always women present. If you go to any visiting room, it's 95% women. Uh, the people who put in the financial cost of paying for the phones, paying for the canteens, um, holding people down, going to court, court for bail, whatever it is, it is women who are consistently giving of themselves, who are giving their homes up, who are putting up their property, and also offering strategies of resistance outside prisons um, in terms of rides, driving women eight hours. So if you don't know a person but they need to go to Renews and it's six hours away, women will drive. If you need to see somebody in Spring Hill, if you don't have money for the phone, someone will put it on for you. If you don't have phones, another woman will text you, my boyfriend's in with your boyfriend, and he just wants you to know X, Y, Z. And women have created all kinds of informal networks of support that do directly speak against what the prison system attempts to do, which is destroy our communities and destroy all love and support. Um, and as I said, they want, for parole it's important to have community support. In reality, they do everything they can to make it impossible for families, whether it's cutting visits, whether it's not offering any visiting support. Um, you know, they, when they're on lockdown, and of course there's no calls, they transport people with no warning. Um, so everything that you can imagine that makes it difficult, yet families persevere, not only persevere, but continue to offer unconditional love and support to raise their children to uh, you know, visit children no matter what, to find money out of nowhere to put into canteens when they don't have that money. If you're on assistance, a fixed income, $50 a month for canteen phones and mail it is nothing. And that's, that's a few letters, nothing, you know, but women are still doing that. So I think that's an important strategy to recognize as well, that we think of the spirit of Malcolm's sisters, how they visited him, how they spoke to him, how they had faith in him, how they're the ones that offered him this outlet out. It wasn't just Malcolm reading books by men, it was these women in his family. I think that's important. I also think it's important to recognize, as Malcolm shows us, the tremendous humanity of those under lock and key. Um, I could speak about, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I get in these conversations where people laugh at me because I'll say something like, you know, I'll be talking about someone like, he's a great guy, I mean, he's convicted of three murders, and people sort of laugh at me, like, oh, that's such a, why would you say that? But um, no matter what people have done, and of course, in our tough on crime legislation, we have Harper, who now wants to offer automatic life sentences, allegedly now <coughs> killing of guards, police, and other terrible crimes. As we know, if that's put in, it will become black people with any weapons, black people with any murder charges, because it's always us. Um, so certainly once, if, if they remove parole, it will be removed from us in all sorts of circumstances. There's 436 offenders that are on dangerous offender right now, which used to be reserved for people like Clifford Olson and Paul Bernardo, and is now being used in a kind of three strikes way. So if you have multiple violent convictions, they're starting to deal people. A young man, uh, Rally, for example, who, you know, uh, it was an attempted murder. He shot the person in the face at the bus station on New Year's Eve. He was threatened with dangerous offender 40 years. He settled for 20. Um, so that's you know, a use of dangerous offender. I, we haven't done the numbers, but I would suspect that those are overwhelmingly black people uh, when we see the numbers going up. Weapons charges now can get you dangerous offenders. The laws have been changed so if you're caught with guns, for example. Not if you're a white misfit. I mean, that's fine. If you're a white misfit trafficking guns up to the states and threatening to plot on the, the uh, Halifax shopping center, you're not a terrorist. But you know, if you're a black person caught with weapons, you're 12 years and dangerous offender. So uh, those laws are also being used, which are going to be used to prevent parole. Um, but I think it's very important to recognize, and, I, and just strategies of resistance within prison with the guys of, you know, people will, hold, will support each other. I don't think people realize, because we do not have communication with those inside by design, 
yet you know some of these older guys that have been in prison for 30, 40 years who are, are supporting the young men when they come in and are educating them and walking them down to the gym and training them and giving them every support they can, you know, calling families and saying he's arrived. Um, and we don't see those people as humans, but they are. I could talk to you about people that you know have five, six bodies on them and have done work within the prisons with young people. You know, and they're the ones doing these programs. They're the ones running them. Um, they'll never get out. You know, the people that we would say are, you know, monsters, but they themselves offer so much love and kindness, which we see from Malcolm as well. It was the men within the prison that he was speaking with. It was people that were sharing their knowledge within the prison. Um, I know I'm out of time. Uh, I have two, 29 seconds left. Um, <laughs> so I think that's important to recognize as well. Um, that there is always, we can't, I, I mean, I guess what I would say is that we cannot, cannot, cannot accept this rhetoric that, you know, those within our prisons are unsalvageable, that those within our prisons are monsters, that if you shoot somebody in the face at age 18, you can and not at age 40 have possibly changed. That you, you know, that the access to programs now that is, you know, dictated overwhelmingly by values that are not, you know, so uh, we can do every program in the book and still go for parole and be told, since in our victim-centered culture, if your victim doesn't forgive you, which they have no obligation to do, uh, that can be used to keep you in as well. So um, I would say within the Canadian context, we need to recognize that they are actively preventing any of the strategies that Malcolm was able to use to resist. They are actively using them on our community to prevent them, and we need to... Uh, recognize that and as a group how do we fight this I don't know but certainly women are every day I would also offer um, providing incredible strategies of resistance and love and support so I'll end there thank you say that if you uh, saw in the original program that uh, Dr. Oh, I've got it. Yeah. Uh, that uh, Dr. G.K. Jeffers was originally going to be on this panel, um, and I share your disappointment that his, I was looking really forward to what he has to say, but was going to say, um, but he can't be here, so I'm here. Uh, and I appreciate so much the invitation to be on this panel. It's obviously an honor. Okay, so uh, let me begin. So in Detroit, uh, does this work? Yes? Oh, good. Uh, on November 10, 1963, Malcolm X delivered what became one of his best-known speeches, Message to the Grassroots. Malcolm X covered a variety of topics in this speech, including racial unity, violence, nonviolence, revolution, black leadership, and white power. But early on in his address, Malcolm X spent several minutes discussing a conference that had taken place several years earlier, a conference that Dr. Uh, Cooper mentioned a minute ago, the Asian African conference that met in the city of Bandung, Indonesia in 1955. Here's a little bit. He, he talks about it for quite a few minutes in the speech. Um, let me just give you a bit of a sense of, of what, he was, what he was saying. At Bandung, all the nations came together. Uh, all the nations came together. The dark nations from Africa and Asia. Some of them were Buddhists, some of them were Muslims, some of them were Christians, some were Confucianists, some were atheists. Again, notice the importance of religion here as well. Despite their religious differences, they came together. Some were communists, some were socialists, some were capitalists. Despite their economic and political differences, they came together. All of them were black, brown, red, or yellow. They, had, they, were, un, they were able sorry, to submerge their uh, little differences and agree on one thing. <coughs> That there, one African came from Kenya and, and was being colonized by the Englishman. And another African came from the Congo and was being colonized by the Belgian. And another African came from Guinea and was being colonized by the French. And another came from Angola and was being colonized by the Portuguese. When they came to the Bandung Conference, they looked at the Portuguese, at the Frenchmen, and at the Englishmen, and at the Dutchmen, and learned or realized the one thing that all of them had in common. They were all from Europe. They were all Europeans, blonde, blue-eyed, and white skins. They began to recognize who their enemy was. So what I want to do is just take this uh, reference from this well-known speech to think through uh, three questions uh, in my time here. So what was this conference uh, that we've already heard uh, a little bit of mention about uh, that was so important to Malcolm X that he would spend so much time talking about it in this, in this address? 
What does Malcolm X's emphasis on that uh, gathering tell us uh, about him and about his times? And what can we, we perhaps learn today uh, from Malcolm X's thinking about racism? So let me say a bit about this conference. Now. The conference uh, to which Malcolm X referred uh, was held in Bandung, Indonesia, which was then uh, uh, an independent country that formerly was a colony uh, of Holland. Um, and so in the place where this conference was held was a site of very recent struggle against imperialism uh, itself. The 29 countries present at this meeting represented more than half of the world's population. Uh, officially called the African Asian Conference, the Bandung Conference was really a formal announcement that decolonization was a fundamental dynamic in the, in the geopolitics of the world that many uh, thought of more in terms of the Cold War. The different powers uh, which convened in Bandung were far from being in one mind uh, about how they thought about world politics. General Carlos Romulo uh, is, is a good example from the Philippines, a good example of someone quite closely aligned with the United States. There he is with uh, a photograph of Douglas MacArthur. Um, while, uh, as Premier of the People's Republic of China, Zhou Enlai was clearly in the communist uh, camp at this, at this conference. Egypt's Prime Minister, uh, Gamal Abdel Nasser, India's Prime Minister, uh, Jawaharlal Nehru, and India's President and the host of the conference, Sukarno, was determined to chart a non-aligned path between the two superpowers. But despite these differences, the Bandung delegates did have a shared uh, experience of Western colonialism, and relations between the delegates were quite cordial. The conference's final communique was passed by all of the 29 uh, delegations represented. It called for respect for human rights, also a very important issue for Malcolm X, um, and national sovereignty, racial equality, and the promotion of mutual interests among the former colonies. What mattered most at Bandung was the way it promoted a sense of commonality throughout what was then called the Third World, and the way it placed race and empire on the international agenda. So Malcolm X wasn't the only African American who was interested uh, in Bandung. The um, journalist Carl, Carl Rowan was there. The great novelist Richard Wright was there and, and wrote an entire book about his uh, visit. The congressperson from Harlem, Adam Clayton Powell, was also there, uh, even though the US government didn't want him to be there, a member of Congress, no less. Um, and it's, it's perhaps uh, their, their overlap in circles in New York, um, Adam Clayton Powell and Malcolm X, that, that might have been some of the source of Malcolm X's great interest in what had taken place there. Uh, W.E.B. Du Bois and Paul Robeson were very interested in the conference. Uh, Paul Robeson in particular very badly wanted to go, but these dangerous radicals uh, were deemed too subversive, and so the United States government uh, did not let them have passports to make the trip. Sorry, can, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. So, Malcolm X's emphasis on Bandung tells us about the global system of white supremacy that he wanted to describe and, of course, overthrow. But what does this mean? It means that racism wasn't only a form of inequality or discrimination located within the United States, but rather, white supremacy was, and of course is, a cornerstone of Western civilization that operates at a global level. Uh, through the domination of Europe and its descendants, <coughs> through colonialism and racial capitalism. As Malcolm X explained about two months before he was assassinated, quote, you can't understand what is going on in Mississippi if you don't understand what is going on in the Congo. Malcolm X's internationalism, his analysis that put struggles against racism and against colonialism into one frame, were the product of, of course, his individual genius, but also the times in which he lived, in which people's movements against global white supremacy pushed back after World War II. Um, the African uh, American Liberation Movement was certainly part, a very important part, of this international effort, but it was one example among many. World War II had interrupted this uh, process somewhat, but insurrection uh, began afterward immediately. And by immediately, I mean on the very first day. In Satif, Algeria, uh, where banners proclaiming, long live free and independent Algeria, were unfold.